so I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm a urologist. I'm really an andrologist. I, I don't do cancer care. Um, and, uh, you know, as Ryan was talking about earlier on about realistic expectations, it's a huge part of my practice, whether it's Peyronie surgery or implant surgery. And over the 16 years I've been at Memorial, it's crystal clear to me that there are populations at our cancer center who have no concept of what they're getting into. And one of those groups is those uh, ADT patients. So, fact, prostate cancer are common. ADT utilization is common, increasing uh, with our radiation colleagues. The ADT duration is individualized. Uh, testosterone is a major homeostatic hormone. And T recovery after ADT may be incomplete. These are just facts. So when a patient comes to see me, um, and he is on or has been on ADT and has a low T, I have a conversation with him about the sexual and the non-sexual consequences of having no or very low T. So we're not talking about hypogonadism or testosterone deficiency. We're really talking about agonadism, so the absence of testosterone. And it's amazing to me how many men have never heard about the non-sexual consequences. I don't get into it in great detail. I say, I think you should speak to your prescribing physician about these and are there things that you need to, any steps that you need to take uh, to offset these. So bone density loss, uh, induction of uh, pre-diabetes or diabetes, and the increased risk of acute cardiovascular events. I think the literature is very clear on all three of these things in men who are exposed to ADT. From a sexual standpoint, of course, the overwhelming majority of men who are on ADT during that period of time and while they have very low testosterone levels have no sex drive. Now, very briefly, sex drive has two components. It's got the visceral sex drive, which is you see something or think of something erotic and wow, right? That's testosterone dependent for nearly all men. The other component is intellectual sex drive. I love my wife. We've been together for 20 years. We had sex all the time. We really should be having more sex. And that is not testosterone dependent. Well, so when you speak to a man on ADT who says he has preservation of sex drive, the overwhelming majority are going to uh, tell you that it's really intellectual. It's not really a visceral component. Nearly all men on ADT and those who have very profound testosterone deficiency will have an inability or great difficulty achieving orgasm. And when they have, have an orgasm, the intensity is reduced. You need testosterone to ejaculate, okay? So let's say not so much the um, prostatectomy patient, of course, they don't ejaculate, but the patient post-radiation early on, uh, those men will have no ejaculate, and they won't understand why. The radiation patient who has not had ADT, uh, the memorial data are that 70% of men at three years and 90% of men at five years will no longer ejaculate. So if somebody's choosing radiation over a prostatectomy because I want to preserve my ejaculate, particularly in the gay community where ejaculation is a hugely important problem, issue, and distress without ejaculation is much higher than in the, in the straight males, um, be very cautious. You can counsel them that there's a very, very good chance that you will lose your ejaculate after radiation, even without having ADT. You need testosterone for erectile tissue health. In fact, the animal model uh, to look at Venus Lee, for example, is the castrate rat model. Within seven days of castrating a rat, they will have collagenization of smooth muscle, Venus Lee. And so when you have ADT, certainly belong further than four to six months out, you're going to start seeing collagenization of that muscle. And that is routine. And that is why men who are exposed to long-term ADT have really very poor erectile function. And you need testosterone for a PD-5 inhibitor response. It's very unusual for patients who are on ADT to be good responders to androgen deprivation therapy. Um, testosterone dependence on prostate cancer is recognized. The role of ADT continues to evolve. I think you're probably seeing more high-risk prostate cancer. We certainly are memorial, and we're certainly seeing greater numbers of men who are exposed to ADT. Uh, it has a role in metastatic disease in conjunction with radiation therapy, intermediate and high risk. Neoadjuvant therapy, pre-RP, I think, I think that Adam said he's going to present something on that uh, over the next uh, day or so. So this is an interesting group of patients in whom I think you really need to have a serious conversation about the expectations long term. And we'll talk about that when, when Adam presents his thing. Uh, adverse effects are increasingly being appreciated. So. 
ADT and erectile function, associated erectile tissue damage, routine collagenization of supine muscle, and men who are on ADT. Certainly for those men on AT, ADT for longer than six months. Historically, more than 80% have significant ED. It's very interesting, Abdul Trace at Boston University has done some very elegant basic science work. He's shown that men uh, in the castrate rat model, or rabbit model actually, that the muscle turns to fat. That it isn't, it collagenizes, yes, but it also turns to fat. And of course that cannot uh, compress the subtunical venules and that leads to venous leak. Venous leak is basically irreversible ED unless we have stem cell therapy in the future that rejuvenates smooth muscle completely. And these patients with leak are unlikely to respond uh, to PD-5 inhibitors. That's in the literature. And of course, having significant venous leak, which comes in low cons grades, uh, severe leak leads to a poor prognosis with intracavernosal injections. Without going into great detail on any of these, if you just look at the top list, this is from, um, um, from us. Uh, if you look at 38 men with neoadjuvant ADT and radical prostatectomy, you'll see the venous leak rates on the, on the right-hand side. And you'll see the number of men who have normal erectile function with EF domain scores over 24. So in patients who have neoadjuvant androgen deprivation therapy prior to prostatectomy, irrespective of how good your nerve sparing is, and we have a four-point grading system at Memorial where one is perfect and four of the nerve is gone, even in men with bilateral nerve sparing scores of one, if they have neoadjuvant ADT, you are converting them to erectile function recovery rates equivalent to men with very poor or non-nurse bearing surgery. Because testosterone is a neuromodulator, and if you don't have much testosterone, the nerve recovery is impaired. What about ADT and orga orgasm? This is uh, from on, 213 patients with LUTs, VT levels correlated with orgasm. Um, our data, 112 men on ADT, three months followed for more than 14 months. Mean sexual activities once per month. 12% had orgasm on more than one occasion. The mean time to complete loss of orgasm was about five months at ADT. Orgasm capability was 12% of men below the six month mark, 8% between six and 12, and 1% beyond 12 months. So if they had no testosterone, 1% of men 12 months later were able to have an orgasm. All had significant reduction in orgasmic intensity and no factors were identified that predicted the ability to retain orgasm. ADT has been shown to reduce insulin sensitivity within a few months of initiation of treatment. So monitoring HbA1c would be important. If you're going to be the ADT prescriber, I believe that the responsibility falls on you or somebody that you work very closely with, an internist, to monitor the hemoglobin A1c. ADT increases the risk of diabetes by up to 60% in the literature. ADT use is linked to coronary heart disease, myocardial infarction, and sudden cardiac death. The Molly Shores data is from the VA is crystal clear. Your T level below 200, increased risk of cardiovascular events, increased risk of premature death. ADT results in bone density loss, and I think we know that osteoporosis is a significant concern. This is the Molly Shores data. So T levels that are very low, not even castrate level, are associated with significant comorbidities. And many of our patients don't understand that. The testosterone guidelines, which I chaired, says patients should be told who have testosterone deficiency that are increased risk for major adverse cardiac events. So if you look at the literature on testosterone recovery, most of it's from the radiation or medical oncology field, very little from uh, urology. T recovery rates are highly variable, from seven to 96% like post prostatectomy erectile function recovery. The challenge is that there's a tremendous heterogeneity in the definition of testosterone recovery. What level of T denotes recovery? Much of the literature says non-castrate level, above 50 nanograms per deciliter, yes, he has recovered, which is crazy, right? Variability in the duration of the ADT exposure, and variability in the length of patient follow-up and their patient and the patient age. Just to review some of the literature, you can see that these studies are incredibly small. 59, 32, and 15 patients, and you'll see that there's significant impairment of testosterone recovery. Not every man has recovery of testosterone. This is interesting data from 2012. This is looking at patient and partner understanding expectations about what ADT is associated with. And on the far left-hand side, you'll see low sex drive and erectile dysfunction. And it's the vast minority of patients and partners who are aware of this. 
They're aware of some bone issues, and anemia, would you believe, is the highest on the far right-hand side. It's crystal clear to me over my time in the business that patients just don't know what they're getting into. And the regret index is very high. Even though they know it's often associated with a need or with an ability to improve their prostate cancer specific survival, they're still unhappy. So we retrospectively reviewed our database of prostate cancer patients. The inclusion criteria included having a total T level checked by LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, in the memorial system, ADT treatment details and patient demographic and comorbidity data. We identified men who'd undergone ADT, who'd had a pre-ADT baseline total testosterone level recorded as well as uh, all of their post-ADT T measures starting at six months after the cessation of ADT. So serial T levels after the completion of ADT. And we excluded men who were castrated baseline, which is a very small percentage. So if you're analyzing the testosterone literature, there are many methodologic challenges that you need to be familiar with. And just to refresh your memory, what about the assays used? So I suspect if I asked you, do you know what assay your hospital uses for total testosterone? You probably don't. And it's probably an immunoassay. And immunoassays have a 15 to 40% coefficient of variation, depending what the T level is. At very low T levels, very high coefficient of variation. 10%, 10 to 30% coefficient of vari variation for free testosterone. I suspect that you don't know what, le what way the free testosterone is measured in your lab. It's probably a calculated method, okay? And LCMS by the CDC has been recommended for measure, measurement of total testosterone because the coefficient of variation is 6%. And equilibrium dialysis for free testosterone. That used to be a research tool. Now it's a, it's a well-established uh, laboratory method. And LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics are at least two of the national labs who do LCMS and do equilibrium dialysis. And if you're going to seriously manage T, I would encourage you to strongly consider using these assays because they're much more accurate, both 6% CV. What about diurnal variation? PT levels occur around between 3, 3 and 8 a.m. and compared to 4 p.m. testosterone values obtained at 8 are 20 to 25% higher, excuse me, I apologize for that, higher in men aged 30 to 40 years and 10% higher in men over 70. So even older men, while the circadian rhythm is blunted, do have, have the potential to have significant differences between their morning and afternoon levels. So where possible, it's preferable to do it in an early morning fashion. We don't have patients fast. The endocrinologist suggests patients fast. The literature in that is incredibly mixed and not convincing. Into individual variation, obesity, weight loss, and exercise all have some impact on testosterone levels. But if you could ace two things, it would be the assay used and the time of the day in doing the blood test. So serum early morning total T levels were measured using LCMS at the same lab in the memorial system and periodically after ADT cessation. The primary endpoint was testosterone recovery at 24 months, and it's defined as you see there. Normalization was defined as the total T level over 300. Back to baseline was defined as the total T level at least as high as baseline level, and return to non-castrate level were men who got back to a total T level of over 50. In the analysis, we selected three, three parameters as potential predictors, and these parameters were chosen based on the prior literature, and they were patient age at baseline, duration of ADT exposure, and baseline total testosterone level. Not on here, which is important, which is we're doing an analysis at the moment, is the presence of diabetes and the presence of sleep apnea, both of which are associated with, with low T. I'm not gonna get into the statistics with you. Honestly, I'm not a statistician, and even I had sometimes difficulty understanding what our statisticians were doing, but there was a serious statistical input into this project. So, 308 of 1,621 men were included in the final analysis. This represents a failure to assess baseline total T levels of 81%. So 81% of men, a radiation oncologist or the medical oncologist, failed to check a total testosterone level prior to starting ADT. And I think that's a real problem. And it's an education issue we have at Memorial. Mean age, as you see listed, primary prostate cancer treatment was RP. Majority received a uh, GnRH agonist, although there were other kinds of uh, ADT uh, used. And the mean baseline T level was 380. The mean duration of ADT exposure was 14 plus or minus 21 months, with patients who were six months and patients who were on it for crazy lengths of time.
ADT exposure, you can see the majority were less than or equal to six months. So standard kind of um, in, induction ADT with radiation therapy. And you can see the distribution listed below there. And the median duration of follow-up was long. We had a long follow-up in the vast majority of our patients. The mean total T levels were covered over time, and you can see them listed here. And these are the means, and these don't represent individual patients. And you can see that the means are approximately the same across the, the spectrum of time. So in univariate analysis, the title says probability of normalization over 300. And you'll see ADT duration is broken down by less than or equal to six months, and um, patient age, baseline T. And if you just look at ADT duration over six months, 60% um, got back to normal. Over 65 years of age, 60%. And T levels over 400 at baseline, 80% uh, of men go back to normal. And the whole group was about 60%. This is, the, this is on univariate analysis. If you look at castrate levels, and if you look at the very bottom here, you'll see the overall percentage of patients who are left at castrate levels was 7.6%. This is two years plus after the cessation of ADT. If you look at duration of ADT over six months, it was 12%, older men 8%, and good T levels at baseline, over 400, it was only 3% of men who were left at castrate. When you start looking at the multivariable models, and if you look on the far right-hand side to adjusted models, and you look at ADT duration less than six months and getting back to normal, they're 1.4 times more likely to get back. 40% higher chance of getting back to normal if your ADT duration is under six months' time. If you're under 65 years of age, you two-fold chance of getting back to, uh, to normal and having a good baseline T level over 400, uh, 1.8-fold chance of getting back to normal levels. So this to me is what's most important because these are the patients who end up getting into real trouble. So ADT duration at less than six months, they had a 1.27 uh, full chance of getting back above castrate level. Patient age that were younger, 1.5, and baseline total T over 400, 1.1. So I would encourage you when you're checking, when you're starting people on ADT, please check a baseline total T level. I would do an early morning level, I would do the LCMS if you could, to see where they stand. And if they're below 400, they significantly increase the chances of not getting back to normal and being left uh, at castrate level. So we've developed a nomogram. This is a very rough version of the nomogram. Uh, we presented at the AUA. It's undergoing some modifications where we're going to include diabetes and sleep apnea in here. But as you all know about nomograms, on the left-hand side, the parameters exist. And the width of that bar represents the importance of the factor in defining the outcome. Okay? And you can see that baseline testosterone level is actually the most important. Now, this is just a nomogram for normalization. We've got one for, um, for remaining at castrate level also. So I'll give you a clinical scenario. This is a, uh, a man who's 60 years of age. He's two years after ADT cessation. He's got a baseline T level of 400 nanograms per deciliter and uh, 12 months of ADT exposure. He's got a 60% chance of run, returning to normal T, total T levels two years post ADT cessation. I will tell you that I don't know any patient that comes in sir, to me knowing that they're going to be left with abnormal T levels long term. A 10% chance of being left at castrate total T levels uh, in, the, in the long term, which I think is a concern. And then a 5% chance of getting back to baseline. So this man has a, a significant chance, 60% chance of getting back to normal, but very little chance of getting back to the 400 level. So I'm going to put out a, a concept here. I've talked about this at Memorial for a long time. Um, met a lot of resistance. I don't understand how we can give men uh, a toxin therapeutic toxin, that is ADT, without getting consent. With all the consequences, if you're taking a mole off somebody's back, they have to sign a consent form, and yet we can give men years and years and years of ADT and leave a significant percentage with low T, and yet we don't have to get a consent to them. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. So take home messages, incomplete T recovery is common after ADT. The minority of men have baseline total T levels checked pre-ADT. I think that's something we can change. 10% of men are left at castrate levels, about a third normalized T levels. Older age, longer ADT duration, and low pre-ADT T levels uh, portend a poor prognosis for these patients. And ultimately, patients should be given realistic expectations, and at least at Memorial Sloan Kettering at this point in time, Many of the patients do not get those expectations given to them. So thanks very much. <laughs>